Welcome everyone to the second virtual event in the Global Adaptation and Resilient Investment Working Group speaker series. We're better known as Gary. Uh, Gary is a private sector, private investor-led initiative with a mission to catalyze investment in resilience. I'm Lori Collins, and I'm a strategic advisor with Gary. I've been working with them for the past five years or so on furthering that mission. Gary was announced at the Paris COP21 to bring in 2015 to bring together public and private sector actors as we have here today. Gary is focused on education, expanding our reach, and driving in innovation in financial instruments for climate resilience. So today's event advances all of those objectives, and we're really excited to have you all here to, to share this event with us. We appreciate the contributions of all of our panelists to bring this together. I particularly appreciate Andrew Isle, who has organized this event today. He will be moderating our panel discussion. Andrew is a climate risk and resilience investment consultant. He's currently head of climate risk for North America with Tata Consultancy Services, known as TCS, which is a global IT solutions and advisory firm. Andrew is a climate policy and market specialist with experience spanning diplomacy, development finance, and consulting. Andrew supports engagements with financial institutions to address climate-related challenges and opportunities. And uh, Andrew has been working with, on these issues related to resilience finance since 2016. Andrew has been involved with Gary since about 2018, and that's when I've met uh, Andrew, back in 2018, he's joined forces with us to help launch this virtual event series. So I'm very excited to hand it over to Andrew and appreciate everything he's done to pull this panel together today. Well, thank you so much, Lori, for that introduction and for, for hosting this, uh, this Gary event today. Very excited to be back with Gary and to be continuing our event series, uh, which uh, I think has really gotten a lot of uh, uh, attention uh, for for all the right reasons, uh, uh, you know, uh, advancing our 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 dialogue and, and understanding of these uh, resilience investment topics. Um, so we've got a great topic today and a terrific panel. Uh, we'll be discussing the uh, role of uh, design standards in promoting resilient waterfront development and uh, how those can help drive resilient investment. Uh, in those, those uh, waterfront communities. Uh, so let me uh, take a couple of minutes here to set the stage uh, before I, I introduce uh, our, our panel today. Um, as recent events such as Hurricane Fiona and Ian demonstrate, many if not most coastal communities in the United States and beyond are acutely exposed to climate impacts, uh, but have yet to take adequate meaningful action to address that vulnerability today uh, let alone change how they pursue coastal development going forward in anticipation of the evolving and more threatening climate conditions of the future. Um, I'd like to take a moment uh, to uh, quote an excerpt from uh, the fourth U.S. National Climate Assessment, uh, which came out in 2018. Um, uh, I, it can be a little bit pedantic to, to quote government reports, um, but I found that this one really uh, uh, encapsulated uh, some of the, the key points that, that these design standards are trying to address. So I hope you'll indulge me for a minute uh, as, I, as I read through some of the conclusions with regard to uh, coastal vulnerability. Uh, the NCA4 uh, section on oceans and coasts says the following, lasting damage to coastal property and infrastructure driven by sea level rise and storm surge is expected to lead to financial losses for individuals, businesses, and communities, with the Atlantic and Gulf Coast facing above average risks. Impact on coastal energy and transportation infrastructure driven by sea level rise and storm surge have the potential for cascading costs and disruptions across the country. Even if some significant emissions reductions occur, many of the effects from sea level rise over this century, and particularly through mid-century, are already locked in due to historical emissions and many communities are already dealing with the consequences. Actions to plan for and adapt for more frequent widespread and severe coastal flooding, such as shoreline protection and conservation of coastal ecosystems would decrease direct losses and cascading impacts on other sectors and parts of the country. 
more than half of the damages to coastal property are estimated to be avoidable through well-timed adaptation measures. Uh, so that was a bit of a handful, uh, a mouthful, but uh, I don't think I could have encapsulated it better in uh, laying out the threat, the fact that it is already here, uh, but that um, uh, well-planned concerted action to anticipate and prepare for those impacts of climate change in coastal areas can have a tremendous impact for people, for businesses, and for communities. And so figuring out uh, how to best uh, plan and deliver that climate resilient development is critical. Um, I should also add that the financial sector, uh, a big part of our, our community here at Gary, uh, is acutely vulnerable to climate related coastal extreme events through its exposure to coastal real estate, other portfolio assets and marketing counterparty risk. This awareness has been in the mainstream since at least the 2016 release of the first risky business report, highlighting uh, an uh, quote, annual price tag for hurricanes and uh, other coastal storms at $35 billion per year. Um, uh, that I think is low, uh, that was from 2016. Uh, this exposure has only grown with the advance of climate change and aggressive coastal development that often is not incorporated in meaningful climate resilience measures. Uh, at the same time, the financial sector is a critical stakeholder together with developers, engineers, builders, policymakers, and multiple levels of government, uh, uh, together with local communities, ensuring that coastal development proceeds in a climate smart way. Financiers can influence project design uh, of coastal development through deal sourcing, structuring, due diligence, term sheets, insurance, and contracts, among other leverage points. And understanding what constitutes smart climate resilient design uh, and development is half the battle. The other half is knowing how to ensure it is baked into project development. So without any further ado, let's get to today's panel. Uh, we will explore the role of new approaches to coastal development guided by resilient development standards. We'll begin with a brief presentation on WEDGE, the Coastal Resilient Development Design Standard developed by the Waterfront Alliance to explain what such standards are, uh, who can or should use them, and what benefits they provide. Our panelists will then explore how these standards are applied in practice, how they change practice on the ground when applied, and how the adoption of such practices can be scaled. We hope to explore the barriers to adoption of such, of such standards with an eye towards identifying strategies to overcome them. So our panelists, uh, uh, very excited to be joined today by Joseph Sutkawi, Chief Waterfront Design Officer for the Waterfront Alliance, Bonnie Campbell, Principal at Two Trees Management, a Brooklyn, New York based waterfront developer, and Shalini Vajhala, uh, Founder and CEO of Refocus Partners, a firm specializing in resilient design and partnership. Uh, very brief housekeeping note, we will start with uh, opening remarks from each of the panelists for the next half hour or so. Uh, then we'll have a panel discussion followed by some Q&A for which we welcome questions from the audience. So please uh, do find the chat feature and drop in any questions and we'll do our best to address those uh, before uh, the end of, of uh, today's event. Um, so um, Joseph, let's, let's dive right in. Um, a brief uh, word of introduction for you. Joseph is the Chief Waterfront Design Officer at the Waterfront Alliance. As the organization's expert on waterfront development and planning, he is leading the growth of the Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines, or WEDGE, through ESG strategies, policy approaches, and professional education. He also leads large-scale resilience uh, studies uh, for the Waterfront Alliance, and he brings experience in ports and waterfront operations, sustainability, economic development, and infrastructure. He previously worked for an urban planning consulting firm, Living Cities, um, New York City, the New York City Council, and the University of Michigan. He has policy degrees from the University of Michigan and from New York University. So Joseph, um, over to you. Please tell us about the Waterfront Alliance and Wedge, and um, what problem is, is Wedge trying to solve, and how is it doing it? Great. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew, for that, that introduction. Uh, let me know if you can't see the, the slides. Waterfront Alliance is an advocacy organization based in New York and New Jersey Harbor. Um, we, we work to inspire and affect resilient, revitalized, and accessible coastlines for all communities. A lot of our work is focused on New York and New Jersey Harbor. 
Um, you know, there's a lot of education, uh, youth education work, advocacy for the maritime industry, climate policy advocacy. Um, and we were, we were founded to try to bring all of these disparate and disconnected groups that have shared concerns around the waterfront together. So we're kind of at the intersection of the environment, um, maritime industry, public access and recreation, and are often looked to as kind of one of the big voices in city planning for, for the region. WEDGE, or the Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines, are our national program. Um, and this is something that it started locally here in around the harbor, um, but it has since been applied nationally because we, we saw that there was a, a, a need for that beyond just this region. Um, so WEDGE is the, the Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines, and it's a rating system for waterfront development. You're probably, many of the folks on the call are gonna be familiar with LEED. You're, you're familiar with Envision. You're maybe familiar with Ready. Um, we're similar to those, but focused on kind of all the complexities that deal with building on the waterfront because it's such a unique, um, it, it's such a unique kind of development. And wedge is based on the three overarching principles that are that are woven throughout the, the standards. So there's resilience, which is what we'll we'll focus on most of, of today, but we're also looking at the ecology of the site and public access on this site. I like to show um, Brooklyn Bridge Park as, a, as an example of kind of how these all interplay together. Um, and most of the time today we'll be talking about um, private sector sites, um, but even though this one's public, it plays such a, a large economic development role, was built through public-private partnerships that I thought it was still useful to show this one. Um, from, a, from an ecology perspective, you know, there's a lot going on at this site. There's lots of native planting areas and protected areas. There's tidal marshland on the site. There are um, uh, tide pools that are built into the rocks that you see on the shoreline. From an access perspective, you have beaches, you have ways to get into New York Harbor in the East River on this site. Um, in kayaks, um, on your own, you can see kind of how busy that pier is on the left side of the, the image. Um, there's a lot going on from an access perspective. And then we have maritime access as well. There's a marina here and that 514 vessel is actually docked at the park itself. We wanna see access for, for larger vessels. And then this all happens in the context of a really active and busy harbor. There are private sector developments all around this site. Those cranes in, in one of the warehouses that you see in the, the background of the photo, it's an active Port Authority facility. Um, with vessel traffic going in and out. And all of these can kind of interact together. From a resilience perspective, there's a bunch of things going on at the park. And I love this, this quote from, this was a conversation with the COO of the Brooklyn Bridge Park Corporation, which manages um, the capital work at the park. He was very blunt about saying that this park will survive the next bunch of storms better because of the resilience that they built in. And there's a bunch of features that, that are built into the, to the site. So just starting with the yellow dots from left to right, and this is not everything, but just some of the highlights, you know, they upgraded the stormwater systems and made it so that they were resilient to sea level rise through different types of, of tide valves and, um, and storage tanks. The marina at the site has a wave attenuator built into it, basically a curtain hanging from the outermost pier that stops waves from coming in and potentially causing damage to the, the boats that are docked there and to upland areas. Um, they've also across multiple points of the park, including that one part in the last photo, um, have lots of softer shoreline. So we're, we try to move projects away from the straight line concrete wall, the bulkhead wall that doesn't provide a lot of resilience protection. Waves can kind of just hit it and jump over. Softer shoreline can kind of diffuse a lot of that wave power. You also have um, elevation changes throughout the park, particularly around where there are, there are structures at the park. Those are protected by, by elevation. There's a tidal wetland at the site that has a big stormwater role. Um, much of this park is at the bottom of a hill, so it collects a lot of of runoff from um, 
adjacent transportation infrastructure and then developments further up the hill. And then even things like the ferry piers that are built into the site are built to be able to handle waves, they're built to go up and down and that can accommodate sea level rise. Wedge uh, looks at projects um, through a, a technical review process and then projects that earn or that, that achieve the standards get what's called wedge verification. Similar to you'd have a lead platinum or an Envision Gold certification, you get wedge verified. Um, there are 10 sites around the, uh, around the country that are wedge verified. It'll be 11 as of uh, uh, next week. We have a, an announcement coming up. Um, and what I wanna draw out um, for folks on this slide is that there's a mix of public and private sector development here. And there's a mix of types of land uses here. So Sandy Hook Pilots Association, Sims Recycling, Oak Point McKinnis Cement, those are all working waterfront and industrial operations. There's another 10 projects in the pipeline that include some offshore wind facilities, including some of the, the really large offshore wind ports. We have Domino Sugar, which is a residential development. Bonnie will tell you all about that one. That's often one that I like to start presentations with, but I figured you'd hear that from her in a few minutes. Um, Bronx Point is an affordable housing development. Greenpoint Landings residential. Hunters Point South is, is city owned, but, but a public private partnership. So there's, there's lots of different types of land uses and, and development that Wedge can accommodate. We all know, I think by engagement with, with Gary and the, and the types of folks that are drawn to calls like this, that investing in resilience pays. So there's a, there's a four to one benefit cost ratio for designing beyond code, code there being the, the 2018 IBC codes. Um, if you're looking just at protecting against hurricane storm surge, that's six to one. These are national numbers, but if you look at places like Florida, that six to one is actually 11 to one. Um, when you start to look at, at more regionalized hazards. There's 730,000 different retail, office, multi-unit residential properties that face flood risk in the United States. And annually, over the next 30 years, we're looking at $13.5 billion a year in damage from flood risk. So I think Andrew before was talking about the, the storm surge and coastal storm surge risk is a slightly different angle looking at all flood risk. But that's a really big number. And as we think about like, what did, happens to repair and replacement cost over time, those are going up too. And this 25% increase is actually a, a pre-inflation number. This, this number from First Street Foundation is a couple of years old now. That's actually, I would, I would expect, a lot higher. If we think about kind of what are the benefits of going through wedge verification, um, at the property level, there's all those, those potential savings through resilience, similar th things through long-term planning through risk reduction, um, green infrastructure. I think above all, Wedge is really great about drawing positive attention to the projects that are doing resilience well, that helps in community engagement, and that helps with leases and tenants and drawing investment to a, to a particular property. So wedge, just to get very quickly into the nuts and bolts, and then we can we can talk more about strategies and, and how things work later in the conversation. But wedge is a rating system made up of categories. Each of those categories has credits that have particular point values assigned to them based on very specific performance indicators that we're looking at around how the site has achieved. And resilience is woven into a number of places in the in the standards, um, both around site assessment and planning, responsible siting and coastal risk reduction, and natural resources. So if we look at that, that first category around site assessment and planning, this is gonna advise projects to do things like look beyond just the FEMA firms, the, the, the flood insurance rate maps that, that are often outdated, um, are not forward looking, they're looking at historical data. So you wanna build in hazard vulnerability assessments that pull from different sources so that you can really trust them. Um, we, we want projects to be looking at um, at least a, a moderate high climate projections. There are sites that, that you know, say they're building in sea level rise, but they're not accounting for very much sea level rise because they're assuming, they're using the projection that assumes that kind of 
the world gets its act together very quickly and, and carbon emissions plummet. We don't expect that's actually happening. So aim for uh, a moderate high or higher projection. And then you want to also be assessing all of the ways and all of the reasons that water can enter a site. Look at more than one storm scenario. These are the kind of things that we're, we're drawing out in projects. Around responsible siting and coastal risk reduction, here we're kind of built around a hierarchy of what are the most effective protections um, against flooding, particularly in a coastal environment. Um, from the, you know, the number one thing that you can do are setbacks, which is just building further away from the water. That's the number one way that you can protect a project. That's not always feasible. Then you can start to think about elevating the site and, and elevating your critical assets. assets. Um, I put the asterisk there because anytime we talk about elevation, that's great in a coastal environment, rivers that can cause some problems. Um, you can also look at things like different landscape-based um, flood control features. Some of the things that we, we saw in Brooklyn Bridge Park, wet and dry flood proofing of the building. And then as kind of a last resort of those deployable flood protections. Um, Wedge encourages projects to engage with local floodplain management and emergency management in the design process so that, that things are accounted for before the building's even operating. And then we also want projects to write that emergency operations plan um, during the design process. From a landscaping perspective or a natural resources perspective, you know, we know that, that landscaping is not permanent. That can be changed. Changes can happen on the site. Buildings are pretty permanent. The stormwater infrastructure that's, that's buried under the building and under the streets, it's really permanent. So you want to be looking at, at your, your storm scenarios and your flood scenarios and the timelines for those differently based on what you're doing. We want to see projects use the co-benefits that exist around green infrastructure to assess the risk of sea level rise on things like outfalls and stormwater infrastructure. Um, and then think about like the neighborhood context um, around you in the planning process. And then planning for heat emergencies. We, we, all of the, the conversation around resilience tends to be around flooding. Heat resilience is actually a, a, a big issue and that's something that's built into wedge as well. I'll stop there and, and send it back to, to Andrew, but look forward to, to um, talking more about kind of how these standards show up on different developments. Thanks so much, Joseph, for that terrific overview. And uh, I think it's already pretty readily apparent uh, what a really rich resource uh, wedge is in um, providing the, the guidance to really be a top achiever in terms of waterfront development. Um, on the one hand, it's not rocket science, right? These, these things are straightforward, they're achievable. On the other hand, uh, it's I imagine very easy uh, not to do them not to do them right or not to do them thoroughly and not really think through uh, all the all the potential scenarios and and all the the key elements that are that are necessary. So uh, I'm really excited uh, to hear how Wedge actually gets implemented, right? And uh, what it looks like to think about resilient design from the outset of a project. And so I'm. We're uh, really very lucky today, uh, and I'm very excited to be joined by Bonnie Campbell, uh, who is a, uh, a developer uh, with extensive experience precisely uh, in that. And um, uh, let me uh, introduce you, Bonnie, before uh, handing you the floor. Um, Bonnie, as I mentioned, is principal at Two Trees Management Company, a development firm uh, based in Brooklyn known for its role in transforming the Dumbo neighborhood and the former Domino Sugar Refinery campus in Williamsburg, both of which are situated along the East River waterfront. Uh, the company Two Trees Management uh, has holdings including 3 million square feet of commercial, industrial, and residential space. And uh, Bonnie leads a team of planners, architects, and development professionals on behalf of Two Trees and is involved in site acquisition, financing, construction, design, leasing, and property management of Two Trees portfolio. As long-term property owners, Two Trees pursues developments that add to the vitality and sustainability of neighborhoods over time. Bonnie joined Two Trees 20 years ago after receiving an MS in real estate development and city planning from MIT. And a, uh, she also has a BA in economics and urban planning 
from Stanford. So, um, uh, Bonnie, it's hard to imagine having just gone through your biography, uh, finding someone uh, better qualified to, <laughs> and experienced to, to, to speak to these um, resilient development challenges and, and these advances uh, that, that uh, Wedge has, has helped to bring in, as have developers like you. Um, so tell us about your, your experience and um, uh, how Two Trees goes about uh, developing a, a, a resilient project uh, from scratch uh, on the eastern seaboard and managing those, those coastal threats. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Let me throw up some slides and move through these pretty quickly. Um, so as mentioned, you know, we're a, a New York based real estate firm. We do um, all of our work very much locally um, and, and most pertinent to this conversation, the majority of our assets are really situated along New York's waterfront, um, right in Dumbo, uh, Domino Sugar, which is just north of the Williamsburg Bridge and our upcoming uh, waterfront development at the River Ring site, which is just north of Domino. So we're, we're long on the waterfront. So um, that kind of leads me to, you know, why do we prioritize resiliency when we uh, approach new development? And, you know, obviously the first one really is a, a sense of civic responsibility. We're a local company, um, we're, we're local professionals sustained commitment to New York and the long-term vitality of New York. But more than that, our, our uh, investment thesis is really one of a, a long-term ownership. We do large neighborhood scale projects um, over multiple years and our kind of return on investment horizon is much, much longer. We're not looking to get out of this, um, these properties. So we, we take a very different approach to um, the, the planning process and the placemaking process. And, and some of that means that we can really capture the benefits of a neighborhood as it improves over time. But it also means that we're much more exposed to long-term risks, um, things like climate change, sea level rise, uh, city infrastructure and how taxed it is and whether or not it'll be able to service development over time. Um, so, you know, we've really had to start to think long and hard in terms of risk mit mitigation, how to adapt and approach um, our development with sustainability and, and infrastructure independence, frankly, um, in mind. So our first real stab at tackling uh, some of these issues from the origin of the project was you know, the Domino Sugar site, which is an 11 acre campus in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, that once refined 98% of all the sugar consumed uh, in America, as, as recent as the 1960s, actually. Um, Domino moved out, uh, redevelopment plan was put together. We purchased the site with a redevelopment plan in place. And 10 days after we um, wired the, the money in the purchase, uh, Hurricane Sandy hit. So it was a real kind of wake up call to rethink and reimagine the development plan for a waterfront site like this from the point of view of res resiliency. Um, so here's the now. Uh, reformulated plan, which really takes a lot of the principles that Joseph was discussing um, and that is at the, the, the heart of the wedge program, um, you know, to try and, and protect both the development, but to prioritize some of the other things. So if you big picture, these are the, 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 the big moves we made in terms of resiliency. One is, you know, just very intuitively moving the building footprints back from the water to higher ground. Um, ensuring that there's no critical infrastructure below grade, um, you know, electrical rooms and that sort of thing. And in some cases now that we're executing the project, just eliminating subgrade space altogether. Um, second, you know, investing in a new, new marine infrastructure, and this is the, the, you know, the flood mitigation, lifting the entire site kind of above the floodplain and, and what will be the floodplain over time. Um, third is how do you populate that, that waterfront space with native vegetation, with um, features that actually retain water. And, and one of the critical um, components we've found is, is creating something where um, New Yorkers are interacting with their ecology and you know, they're, they, they see the river, they're part of the river. So we've really incorporated environmental education into the public space that fronts on the river as kind of a resiliency strategy. Um, and then in terms of infrastructure independence, which is kind of also critical for sustainability and resilience, um, we are constructing now a, a on-site wastewater treatment facility for the entire campus so that 
all wastewater generated, um, none of it will go into the city system, which is overburdened and, you know, um, has risk associated with it, but we're going to treat it all on site, reuse what we can, and then the rest of it, clean water goes back into the river. Um, so these were kind of, this was our first, our first uh, foray in kind of tackling some of these issues. And, um, and then, you know, we, uh, as we look toward the site north of Domino, um, we really had to, and, and we're excited about um, even taking things a step further and um, embracing, trying to be trailblazers, so to speak, in terms of like how you really think about um, resiliency from like a hundred year um, standpoint. Um, so this is the River Street site that uh, we acquired a few years ago. And, um, you know, while it has more challenges maybe than Domino, it's closer to the river, it's lower. It also had, from our perspective, a lot of opportunities. It has some infrastructure in the water that's historic that, you know, used to be mooring bollards for fuel ships that pulled up, but some of it allowed us to think about the site differently. Um, here you can see the existing condition. And let's see, this is a little video that kind of, and a lot of this really resonates with what, um, what Joseph said about, you know, getting away from the hardened edge, the bulkhead that actually just reverberates wave energy and does not go a long way for resiliency and storm protection. But what if instead we um, use that infrastructure that's in the water, and this is similar to what Brooklyn Bridge Park did around their, their boats, but um, create a real breakwater that can attenuate the wave. And then in the calmer water, that gives us the opportunity to create a more softened riparian edge, um, which is actually similar to the historic uh, water edge. And, and that creates opportunity for ecological diversity, habitat restoration, all of these things stabilize the shore. And then again, pushing the development back from the water's edge to create kind of, this is a real microcosm of a resilient edge. Now, obviously this can't protect the whole, um, the whole shoreline, but if, if projects have interventions like these up and down the shoreline will be in much better shape. And, and the truth is that, you know, upon studying, let's toggle back and forth here, you can see the, the caissons and the old infrastructure that's there and how we've used them here to create um, a softer, more sustainable edge that allows us to have some of these performance standards um, that are integral to things like wedge and, and environmental education and just a, a, a more resilient shoreline. Um, th this is just showing kind of what, what happens to the wave energy when you um, install an intervention like this in the water. Um, and here's the, the finished the Venice site. And, and you know, with this project, we wanted to take Wedge and, and really push ourselves to, to create something that's more of a model for resiliency that also allows New Yorkers to really interact with the water, um, to we, you know, look to our European counterparts to see how we can um, actually still develop on the water, but in a much more responsible way. Um, and then again, to highlight that these features, which I pretty much just talked about, but reusing infrastructure, creating break waters, interventions, wave attenuation in the water, um, re reintroducing ecology and habitat really does stabilize the shoreline. It's like the historic riparian edge that was once there, stabilized with native vegetation, salt marsh. Um, and again, the, the, public, the public access and the environmental education, bringing people into the water to understand our natural environment here in New York, um, and then the, the infrastructure independence as well, we're incorporating this project. So, so that's, that's kind of where we've been and where we're going um, in terms of a firm uh, that is still bullish on waterfront development, but thinks it can be done you know, responsibly and sustainably. Stop share. And now I'll turn it back to you, Andrew, questions or the next speaker. Yeah, Bonnie. Wow, those those projects are really stunning, uh, and and I think uh, really uh, a, a, an attractive uh, and an inspiring pair uh, of examples uh, for how to do resilient waterfront development. Um, uh, a couple uh, very quick questions uh, before we we move on to Shalini. Could you um, say a little bit about what stage uh, the Domino project and the River Ring project are are at, and where which of those were photos versus renderings? Yeah, sure. So Domino, um, we 
we we got the full scale of the 11 acre project approved in 2014 and we've been bringing a building online every couple of years um, so that project will conclude in about three years we have um, three or four of the buildings up either fully open or in under construction domino park opened in 2018 um, so that that project's very much uh, all, nearly complete i should say and and was i think one of the first uh Right, Joseph, to receive the wedge certification um, when Domino Park opened. And the rivering project is new. We, we got it approved in early, uh, at the end of 2021. Um, and we expect to break ground in a couple of years. We have a lot of um, design work to do to finalize everything, but um, that will kind of come online in let's say, you know, five or six years. Amazing. Thank you. Um, well, very eager to, to, to delve into some of those details during our discussion as well. Um, but first, let me um, uh, introduce our third panelist. Uh, Shalini Vachala is founder and CEO of Refocus Partners, a design firm dedicated to developing integrated resilient solutions and public-private partnerships for communities around the world. She also co-founded the Atlas, an online platform for local government collaboration and procurement innovation. Previously, Shalini had multiple positions at the US EPA and the White House Council on Environmental Quality. Uh, she holds a Bachelor's of Architecture um, <clears throat> and a PhD in Engineering and uh, Public Policy from Carnegie Mellon University. Um, so uh, Shalini, you uh, really uh, have practically written the book on, on um, public-private partnerships and developing projects. Um, uh, with with resilience in mind uh, across um, uh, many different regions. Um, how can resilient design standards help to catalyze uh, climate smart and resilient development? And what is in your experience at, at Refocus and, and beyond, uh, you know, uh, shed some light on, on, on this topic for, for this group? Thanks, Andrew. I love being in this type of discussion because you're actually looking at real built environment improvements for real people. And so I'm gonna share my screen here. And what I'm gonna focus on as an introduction to refocus and also um, the question that you asked, Andrew, is really a lot of our work is in the pre-development space. So that space between Joseph, where you are on the design standards and Bonnie, where you reach on, you know, a major redevelopment plan and envisioning a brighter future. And a lot of what we have to do with local governments and folks who are looking at sites like the Domino Sugar site is try to widen their imagination, but also really confront the problem of when you are trying to do large scale resilience projects, success is something that doesn't happen. So in my former life at EPA, right, this is the kind of thing where in the first year you're applauded, the second year your budget goes away because you clearly don't need it because nothing happened. And so a core of what we do is we are a design firm, but we integrate funding and financing early, early, early into the design process. And we do that in four key ways. So I'm gonna give you examples of each one. The first is we ask really simple questions to find motivated champions. And so we look for who loses money if you don't do something well. The second, we really try to align benefits the same way that Bonnie was describing. The third is to try to put together cross-sector value. Um, so Bonnie, I don't know very many developers who are brave enough to build water treatment plants. <laughs> and so <laughs> that's, that's the kind of courage we try to motivate. And then lastly, we really link physical and financial protections. And these are the four entry points that we create so that you have some imagination about these big sites that could seem like problems but also have huge potential opportunities. And so I'm gonna walk through each of these and I hope they are inspiration for um, all of the, the panel audience to really ask all of us questions because our goal at Refocus is to move money and shovels to communities that are rarely first in line for you. To be able to do that, you have to be able to translate big picture benefits, the hundreds of billions of dollars saved for resi you know, resilience writ large into who loses money if we don't build this coastal protection. In some cases, that's whoever's operating the critical infrastructure. When that landfill gets flooded, who suffers? When the hospital is underwater, where do those costs trickle through the economy? 
A lot of times what we're doing is looking at balance sheets today. Where does the transit system go offline? I'm here in San Diego and we have a major Amtrak line that is sliding off a cliff. And so we've lost our rail service to LA. Who loses money when that happens? How do you motivate them to act? How do you align those stakeholders? So very rarely are we talking about big, broad future benefits. We're often talking about specific current benefits and losses and how they align with those big dollar amounts in future. And that really surfaces who has the incentive to act. Once we have those champions, then you have a really open field to talk about how to hitch your wagon to a bigger horse. I've um, now done enough work in the Gulf Coast and in Texas that I use analogies like hitching my wagon to a bigger horse. Um, but this is a, an image from the city of Hoboken, which for all of you are familiar, you know, Hoboken is a postage stamp size city, but it's 98% paved. And on Hurricane Sandy, parts of it were under 12 feet of water. So we worked with the city back in 2013 and what we did was exactly look at this opportunity in the pre-development space to not just buy the immediate Band-Aid, but to think more creatively about what was possible. And so instead of investing in only flood pumps, the city of Hoboken, prior to the rebuild by design process, worked with us in the very early stages on a six acre contaminated site that is now under construction and set to open this year for the Northwest Resiliency Park. And the way that we started this conversation is we looked at needs bigger than the immediate resilience need, which was flooding. And we said, well, what else do you need? And they said, parking and green space. And so we worked with the city to help find ways to mobilize water funds and co-finance the project with municipal parking fees. So if you think about a bathtub, you know, if, if you've got cars floating down your street anyway, why can't you flood a parking garage to hold water and do it on purpose? And so we lived in that early pre-development space of just widening the imagination and huge kudos to everyone who followed us. We pass, we think of our work like a relay race where we run the first leg and pass batons um, to all the runners that follow, the design firms, the engineering firms. But huge kudos to the imagination in the city and the leadership, because this is now a site that's going to transform an area that had very little green space for its residents. The third thing that we do in, the, um, in getting unstuck to make sure that resilience projects actually move forward and don't just sit on the drawing board is we do a lot of English to English translation and talking to the folks who are most pissed off. Oftentimes that is the maintenance department or the public utilities. <laughs> this example is from the city of El Paso, which um, I know this is not a coastal example, but the, the premise is relevant. The city of El Paso was doing remarkable work to manage flash flood risk and install green and nature-based infrastructure solutions. So think retention, detention, diversion of storm water. The maintenance department just saw it as an added burden and added cost. These were beautification projects that require more staffing, more maintenance. What we were able to do with the city as part of a workshop funded through the Kresge Foundation is really ask the question of who, you know, how does this play out in terms of maintenance costs? If you were to build these projects, what would that look like? And it turns out if you build green and nature-based infrastructure in smart ways, you can actually increase road asset lifetimes. Fewer roads get washed away in flash floods. And so that all of a sudden landed completely differently with public works, with maintenance. And now um, the city is doing remarkable work. And so focusing on these pain points rather than trying to dismiss them can often reveal a solution that you might not have otherwise and enable bigger projects. The, the last space where our team at Refocus really does deep dive work is we, we work within the financial sector with large insurance firms, particularly brokers, to understand where investing in physical risk reduction also creates financial risk reductions. And so we've spent quite a bit of time working on things like how do you adapt catastrophe bonds to support 
green and resilient infrastructure finance. So if you think about this like life insurance versus health insurance, right? You would never trade one for the other. And you don't really want to use either one. But if you are in a space where you're building resilient infrastructure, you should be reducing your costs. How do you make sure that that plays out in places like the Gulf Coast of Texas, where they're looking at $35 billion worth of investments to protect industry and workers? And what that looks like for me in practice is understanding when you have a bunch of companies that have fortified their sites, but the public bridge or road washes out so workers can't get there in an emergency, and then you have a plant explosion. Who suffers? Who loses money? How do you prevent that? What does that look like in terms of liability and workman's comp insurance? So we really get down to the nuts and bolts of this. Our team could not be more excited despite all the dire news out there because of all of the federal fire hoses of money that have just opened up. And we really lean in to looking at every color of money as a possible source of resilience, funding and finance. This is not about finding the specific earmark for things that are green or resilient. It's about taking 200 plus billion dollars of transportation funding to create coastal resilience, to understand how do you not just make a road stronger, but how do you turn a road into a coastal protection for a community? What that looks like in practice for us is taking a really messy set of community needs and priorities working through local government silos and understanding what you really build and how and spending time in messy things like procurement, which is often fear driven as much as it is rules driven. And then turning that into something where we can actually engage with folks in the private sector and layer public and private funding. So with that, I will hand it back to Andrew and look forward to all of your questions. Thank you, Shelley. So much great stuff to dig into there. Um, I, I loved how you um, focused on uh, widening the imagination because um, whoever would think uh, to turn a parking garage into a, into a bathtub, right? Uh, <laughs> or or uh, caissons for refueling in, in, in uh, the River Ring case into the uh, amazing uh, natural infrastructure that it is uh, today. And that the the magic that you work uh, with stakeholder engagement and you know the the, the dark arts of of uh, federal budgets uh, you know it's pretty amazing stuff. Uh, it sounds you know really uh, uh, mundane and eye glazing in the details, but when you look at the results, it's 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 pretty incredible. So um, wow, a lot to dig into. Um, so um, let's go back in, in the same order um, uh, as we, we uh, began with, with the panelists and, and delve in a little bit. Um, uh, so Joseph, I wanted to uh, go back to you and um, uh, ask a little bit more about the genesis of the wedge standard. Um, uh, because clearly uh, Waterfront Alliance is onto something. You're meeting a, a real need. And uh, it's been painfully slow in many instances to actually work this magic, right? Um, to, to put these good ideas into practice. Could you tell us a little bit about how the Waterfront Alliance came to develop the wedge standard um, and, um, and, and who's also involved in it? Um, the actual individuals, I uh, would love to hear a little bit about that as well. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So wedge has been around for about eight years and the national version, we're currently on version two of Wedge, uh, which is the national version that's been around for about four. And the, the, the challenge that it was, it was trying to solve is that you have a ton of changing land uses on the waterfront, new attention coming to resilience uh, projects and the need for resilience. This, this was, you know, the very first conversations around Wedge started happening after Hurricane Sandy here in New York. And you have all of these kind of competing interests on the waterfront with no real way of assessing is a, is a project doing this well? Is it, is it creating protection while also creating public benefits and public access while also 
serving the environment. Because you can do one of those areas really well. You can put up a 50 foot seawall that is, is going to be terrible for the community, but it will protect it. So it's a wedge was is set up to figure out kind of how, what are all of the different features that we want to see? How do you balance those? And then how do you encourage development, both public and private, to try to actually get there and create better outcomes for community members. The first version of Wedge, when Waterfront Alliance started to put it together, there were about 150 different stakeholders that, that came together um, to influence that system. And it's, it's everyone from you know, city planning and, and state regulatory agencies to the architecture, engineering, planning, landscape architecture community, insurance industry was, was in there, environmental professionals, maritime industry, a lot of kind of interests that are often in direct competition with each other. The ports are, are concerned about the kayakers and vice versa. We wanted to bring everybody in, uh, to the table to figure out, okay, what's gonna work and, and how do we get there? How do we balance all these things? And the sweet spot that, that Wedge hits is that it does, push the envelope beyond what even the best building codes in, in the most um, forward-looking cities, it's beyond what they're requiring. But it's also still achievable because what we don't want to happen is, is create this incredible vision for what can happen that then Bonnie can't actually achieve because it's impossible and it would be so expensive to do that it wouldn't actually work in the real world. So it's about creating that balance. Every time that we've then done an update of the standards, which we're doing now, we're, we're over the next um, few months gonna transition from the current version two to version three, we've brought together different technical advisory committees to, to help steward that process. And the current one includes um, the Department of Environmental Protection in New Jersey and in Florida. Uh, we've got New York City planning. We've got a bunch of architecture and engineering firms. We have um, Risk Reduction Plus Group, which is a, an insurance provider. Uh, we have academics, all kinds of folks. And then there's a much broader set of stakeholders that, that we engage for kind of technical expertise that don't sit on that committee. And that would include folks like FM Global and Munich Re, who are both going through the the standards to make sure that our flood protection guidance aligns with what they're assessing projects on when they do their own engineering assessment. So it's all about like how do we find all of the right technical experts and bring them together to figure out what pushes the envelope and what's actually doable in the development world. I love that balance of, of ambitious but, but doable. Um, so, uh, you, you mentioned that, you know, front of mind is, is making sure that it's, uh, that it's achievable, right. And, and not setting the barrier, uh, the, 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 uh, I guess the, uh, the bar too high. Um, Bonnie, I wanted to ask you, um, uh, what the process looks like, right. In, uh, developing these. Uh, really visionary and and very ambitious uh, projects. And um, you know, at what point did you engage with with Wedge? Uh, was it simply a you know a, a, a fortuitous alignment of of uh, vision, or did you really use Wedge to to guide the design from the from the beginning? Tell us a little bit about how the the two projects you presented came together. Yeah, I mean, I think. Um... Temporally, you know, it's interesting that kind of the fruition of, of, of Wedge happened with Hurricane Sandy, and that certainly was one of the, um, the factors that led us to redesign what had initially been approved for Domino because, because of Hurricane Sandy. Um, so, you know, those that was the, the beginning of that was fortuitous, but, but not the end of it. I think that um, what Wedge really helped us to do at Domino and absolutely pushed us to do for River Ring is really that kind of collective widening of imagination. Um, you know, designing in a vacuum, you know, first we, designing in a vacuum, you just, you're, you're not getting all of the ideas. Um, 
And so we can look to our European counterparts, we can look to like other models in, in the city, but I think taking that you know, wider um, metric of, of, of the wedge categories allowed us to really kind of benchmark our thinking and, and frankly absorb some of the tech, technical expertise that went into the wedge guidelines in the first place um, to really just make, make us more creative and push our design professionals to be more creative. Um, so, you know, definitely at River Ring, um, you know, I think using using those as guiding principles helped lead us in directions that we may not have otherwise gone in. And then in terms of like, you know, what really makes us do that? I mean, I talked about our, our longer term horizon. So we're really thinking about owning and operating for a hundred years, not, not one mortgage cycle, for example. Um, but it's really kind of a combination of the carrots and the sticks. Like, um, you know, why, why would we pursue a wastewater treatment plant on site in a private development? Well, one is that water and sewer rates are astronomical and, and they're unpredictable. We don't know what's going to happen. We know that the Greenpoint um, plant is at capacity. We know that there's more development coming online. So when we kind of run out our pro forma, we say, well, we don't know where these, these operation costs are headed. We know it's not good. Um, so that's kind of, you know, and then here we have an agency locally in DEP that has a mandate by the EPA to get rid of their combined stormwater overflow system in the city of New York because it's polluting our waterways. So we have an agency that's aligned with us in some ways to keep wastewater, new wastewater out of their system. Um, so they provide a carrot. They say, hey, if you treat it on site, we'll reduce your sewer rates uh, for the next forever, right? So, so that allows us to mitigate the risk of um, you know, infrastructure costs and water you know, operational costs going forward in a way that we can predict right now. Um, locks it in. So, so it really is kind of the combination of regulation, of incentives, of programs like Wedge, and then of kind of thinking much, much more long term um, that, that sets the stage for, for being a little more ambitious than maybe a one off kind of mortgage cycle. Um, well, clearly that that long term thinking is really transformational in terms of the uh, I think that the nature and the caliber of these of these projects that you're developing. Um, coming back again to, to the connection with Wedge, um, could you um, tell us uh, where the touch points were with um, the with you know Joseph and his team and the uh, Waterfront Alliance and and the, the Wedge uh, standard. Uh, adoption process, right? Uh, clearly there were a lot of motivations, right? Uh, and uh, a number of them were aligned. Um, but uh, at what point, you know, was the, the, uh, the course of the, the planning and the design potentially redirected, right? Or transformed because of this interaction with Wedge? Yeah, I think, you know, for the first project, Domino, it was almost reacting to this new program that was coming through. And, and it allowed us to see where we landed without the benefit of Wedge having existed before the design in some ways, uh, where we landed, how to benchmark. And, and we could make incremental improvements, of course, but it wasn't like it didn't um, feed into our design process. Whereas, but, you know, when we got to River Ring, Wedge was already a formal process. Um, and I'll say two things about it. One, I think using those categories, and it's much like the LEED certification um, you know, criteria that we look at when we're building a building, it allowed us to, to benchmark the design as we designed. Um, and in terms of you know, what, what the incentive was, one is you know, everything that I've described in terms of just mitigating risk and you know, um, just an overall kind of approach to sustainability and a civic responsibility. But the other is that we were going through a public entitlement process where we were asking the city and asking the community for an for rezoning and entitlement. And, and in doing so, you have to demonstrate um, you know, effectively that you are proposing something that's responsible and beneficial for the neighborhood. And sometimes that takes the form of affordable housing, definitely lead certification, but it's for the first time having a program like Wedge has enabled us to um, telegraph, to broadcast to the community that, hey, you know, it's not just green building, it's not just affordable housing, it's not just public open space, but we're really thinking um, about sustainability and about resilience uh, as we, as we um, move this into the design. So those were, you know, the motivating 
factors. Gotcha. Um, so, uh, Shalini, I want to come back to, to you um, because clearly you uh, have, have um, focused uh, very extensively in your, your work with, with Refocus on um, overcoming barriers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so that is clearly such a critical challenge here, right? We have um, some fabulous examples of how this design has been done thoughtfully from the outset uh, and is delivering these really amazing results. But, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's hard to perform like that everywhere, right? <laughs> and, and there's such a massive need. Uh, what, what do you see as, as the, the, um, the opportunity set? Um, you know, what, what barriers can be moved uh, or, or removed? Um, what, is, what does progress look like, right, in terms of uh, encouraging resilient development uh, at a broader scale? I love this question. I mean, I think, Andrew, I'm going to try to tackle the questions that are in the chat as well and fold them into the response here, because I think one of the biggest barriers is collective action. And Bonnie, I would be so curious where you felt like you bumped up against the seams of someone else needing to do something with you and who you were able to move at the right pace with you and who you had to walk away from. And so like, it's great to hear that the DEP moved with you. I think in a lot of cases, what I tend to find is that the champions of the bigger projects aren't the owners or the operators. You know, it's often someone who's looking at something at a landscape scale, who's able to see the connections and, and to really think about things. I use the analogy of an Olympics all the time because there's an organizing principle for doing a whole bunch of different things that have to happen in a certain time frame. I think one of the biggest barriers to doing large scale resilience investment is the lack of forcing events. There's a lot of motivation. There's a lot of awareness of the losses, but it's not like an Olympics where you have to have, a, have everything open by the, a certain date. And so what we really try to do is create those forcing events for collective action and make sure that you start early enough in that pre-development spot process so that you get the right people along. I think the nightmare scenario for us is when you have a, an individual or a community group that is trying to renegotiate the height of a coastal protection in a town meeting eight years in. Like that's, and that is a likely scenario in large parts of the country because of how we handle the early stage design and planning where you have multiple actors. I think, um, Bonnie, I'm gonna hold up two trees as an example going forward because what you've been able to do is very much um, to widen the closed loop and keep your, I'm doing like to keep your hands around the whole thing. I think that's not available to a lot of local governments. So we've done a, a lot of work with folks in the city of Norfolk and the adjacent towns. And so Douglas and Karen's questions that are in the chat is when you get beyond a parcel size or when you get beyond a municipality size, you have to really look for who can drive and who needs to be on board. And a lot of times what folks don't recognize is that cities don't own a lot of assets. Asset ownership is spread pretty widely across utilities, across cities, across the private sector. And so this is one of my favorite things about Wedge, Joseph, is that you, you have widened um, the idea of standards to be, be something about sites and systems as opposed to parcels and buildings. And I think that really helps clarify the imagination um, without limiting it. You know, you, you provide those benchmarks, but you don't set a ceiling where you just kind of check a box. It really does take more creativity and alignment. And so I, I think one of the ways that we've been able to do this is by asking that question of who loses money. And then all of a sudden you do have an entry point with you know, the hospital system to work with the city or the Navy to understand that their workers can't get to base and they don't have control of how they get there. And so that's really where we've been able to not only motivate collective action, but to keep everyone hanging together at the same time frames. Where we've seen the failures are where you don't start early enough with the right people or where you create false expectations on how long something's gonna take. Anybody who tells you you're gonna do a major development in two and a half to three years is just lying. 
<laughs> and we say that we're very plain about it. And so we really calibrate people to longer time frames for larger projects. Thanks, Shalini. Um, well, I, I think you know this this toolkit for uh, engaging stakeholders that you've developed with Refocus, that Wedge itself has has developed, um, that uh, Bonnie clearly has engaged in, really is emerging for me as as you know a critical element in the, in the process, right? Um, because fundamentally, these are community uh, projects, and the, the community not only stands to benefit, of course, but um, they, they also uh, are essential for getting the projects to, to move forward and to be designed in a, in a, in a thoughtful way. Um, I wanted to also pick up on something you were, you were uh, mentioning, Shalini, related to costs, right? And, and uh, who pays uh, or who uh, you know, is potentially saddled with the losses in the case of a, you know, an, an extreme weather event, right, related to, to, to climate. Um, Bonnie, um, for the, the Domino uh, Sugar Project uh, and for, for Rivering, um, you know, I'm sure a lot of those elements of the project are very costly and time consuming and expensive. And could you tell us a little bit about um, the calculus of, um, you know, how you get those to pencil out and, um, you know, what are you able to do in terms of, you know, attracting investment or reducing costs or, you know, increasing revenue, having done all of that hard work uh, to integrate the resilience into the project? Yeah, I think, you know, and Domino and River Ring are a bit distinct in this, uh, you know, for Domino, the, the, the value play was very much about placemaking. Um, so the resiliency in terms of lifting it up and making sure that there was a public open space um, adjacent to the water and, and doing some of those other factors. I mean, really what, what, what paid for that um, was our ability to make the place extremely desirable. So we, you know, where the, the code required us to build pieces of the park every time we brought a building online, we knew that from like a long-term value standpoint, bringing the park building the park up front and, and opening it to the community and the public and the neighborhood would start to make a place, a place that people wanted to be. So but by the time we built the buildings, the buildings were already more valuable. So I think, you know, that that was our, our, our kind of um, investment strategy at Domino that that allowed us to think about some of the benefits of resiliency things that we built into it that may have been more costly than had we just built a code compliant project. Um, it was really part of this place making exercise. With River Ring, um, and this kind of gets back to the stakeholders, from the beginning, you know, when we brought everyone in the room together to talk about, you know, what what the project would consist of. And we did a bunch of workshops with the local community about like what they wanted a public open space to be. And we heard a lot from people that, you know, rather than this kind of esplanade along the water, like we want to interact with our river. Um, so, you know, we were very clear that the trade-off there, like we can't just build all of this um, marine and public infrastructure without paying for it. So the trade-off there is housing and is density. Um, I'm a big believer that density belongs in the city. And, you know, we did run up a course against NIMBYism and this community has, has development fatigue. There's been a, a tremendous amount of development along the waterfront, but we really had to have that conversation early that, you know, this is gonna be beneficial, not just for these buildings, but it's gonna be beneficial to the buildings to the north of us that were completely flooded during Sandy. And those were some of the natural, the most natural kind of NIMBYs or pro project opponents is because you know we're gonna block their view, it's new development next door, but they had to really kind of grapple with, wait a second, that's true. However, they're building this infrastructure that's gonna protect my property long-term. So I think bringing some of those trade-offs to the forefront early in the process, manage people's expectations because we're not a city, we're not a municipality, we are in business to make money. Um, so we need to make sure that we can pay for some of these innovative solutions. Um, and that's... So um, I wanted to turn back to you, Joseph, for, for a minute to 
elaborate a little bit more about the various players who are involved in the wedge standard. I think that we're really hearing that uh, to do this design properly, there's a tremendous amount of upfront work uh, that's you know interdisciplinary that really is engaging uh, many aspects of the community, very, many different kinds of expertise. How does Wedge do that? Uh, and, and who is actually involved uh, in the application of the standard in the context of a project? It's a, it's a great question. The very first credit in Wedge, 0 0.1, is actually about bringing a multidisciplinary and diverse team to the project. So we don't want to, to see just, you know, one engineer is leading the, the whole thing. We want to see that, do you have coastal engineers? Do you have landscape architects? Do you have permitting expertise? Is there an environmental professional? Is there someone who's going to deal with operations on the site? All of those are built into the standard as a requirement that you have to have a, a multidisciplinary team. We also have seen time and time again with the, the, the wedge projects that have, that have gone through verification, the earlier that the team starts to engage with Wedge and use it almost as a, as a checklist to see how, you know, how many of these features can we bring in that results in better outcomes. And Wedge is set up in, in every credit has two different sections to it. There's a design strategies that are just all the things that we have seen work on sites. And here are the you know, interesting approaches that you can take. Here are the effective approaches you can take. Those generally are not required, but suggested. But then there's the performance indicators that we're actually gonna score the project on. And so the, you know, the, a combination of the environmental professionals on a project, the landscape architect, the civil engineer, the coastal engineer, the, the building architect, um, the community engagement teams, all of those people can be drawing from what's in the web standards, what's in those design strategies and what those performance indicators are to figure out kind of how it embeds in a project. From a very kind of technical perspective on how wedge functions, you know, we, our, our official partnership is with the, the project owner, whether that's the city agency or whether that's a, a developer like Two Trees that's who we sign the, the MOU with. Um, and then Wedge will do typically two different reviews of the project. Um, so we'll come in and do a review at the 50% design stage. And then again, at the 100% construction document stage. So 50% design, our reviewers will offer a lot of feedback. Here's how you can improve your score. Here are things that we're concerned about. Here are places that we see opportunity. For the, for the project team to kind of take back and think about, um, and, and, and we kind of acknowledge in the process that we don't have the full insight into the project that the design team does. And there, there are trade-offs that exist on, on any site. At 100% construction documents, that's when we actually provide the yes or no wedge verification. You get a, a the project gets a final score. That review is, is project managed by Waterfront Alliance. But then we bring in our own set of technical experts who've all gone through. We have a, a training course called the Wedge Professionals course. They've all gone through that um, and they are doing the review behind the scenes. It's typically a team of four. There will be a, almost always a civil engineer and a landscape architect. And then depending on you know, the type of project, those other two team members could be an architect, a um, flood modeling expert, somebody in the environmental space, an urban planner, but that team of four is who's actually looking at the basis of design documents and, and narratives and construction documents and design drawings and contracts, going through all that to actually identify, you earned six points here, you earned eight points here, you earned 12 points here to come up with that final score. And then we work with the, the developer after that verification happens, usually the kind of the beginning of construction, um, to then really celebrate that that achievement, make it public, draw a lot of attention to to it. So there's different people that kind of come into the the standards at different times, and we are often liaising with the engineering team, 
the landscape architecture team and the and the developer themselves. So uh, really, uh, you know, an intricate set of interactions, right, and and touch points uh, along the way. Um, you mentioned that you've only recently expanded Wedge beyond the New York City metro area. And so sort of a follow up question is, how do you take this show on the road, right? <laughs> Sounds like you've built a community uh, that's very effective in New York, but, you know, it's so heavily dependent on, you know, the buy in and the awareness and the training of people. What does it look like when you go to other regions, um, uh, perhaps regions that are less familiar, who may not have as many qualified professionals uh, like New York, and and then try to implement wedge projects? Yeah, that's a that's a great question and something that you know we are very actively focused on, um, and is a big part of my role at, at at the alliance. We our motivation to expand was that we kept getting questions and phone calls from other communities and it and it you know i'm on a panel with the city of seattle for their comprehensive plan next tuesday um, and those kind of opportunities and and um, project ideas just kept coming in the door and that's what really really motivated the expansion of wedge one of the one of the major transitions that happened as a as a result of COVID, actually is that we shifted our annual training to go from in-person, where we had a very heavily New York, a little bit of New Jersey audience, to a much more national audience. Our last course was only about half people from New York and New Jersey with Boston and Miami and Jacksonville and San Francisco all having really healthy contingents of professionals go through the training. And then a lot of the the you know, the engineering firms that, that we work closely with and that are involved in a lot of projects. So, you know, the, the, the Jacobs Engineering's and HDR and Arcadis, all these, these firms that do a lot of this actual design work, they're all national or even multinational firms anyway. So they kind of spread that, that knowledge around. But our overall strategy for kind of how do we expand wedge into these new cities is to take a multi-pronged approach. So there's, there's goals and, and this is how we initially got connected to Gary, but we're thinking about the, how you embed wedge and resilient design into ESG standards. So next year we, we expect that wedge will be recognized in grid as a, as a green building system. Um, we're, we're engaging with individual climate um, focused financers um, to figure out how do we build wedge into their portfolios. Um, from a policy perspective, we're looking at, you know, how do we build community momentum around the project? So engaging advocates in places like Boston and Miami and Jacksonville. And then how do we embed wedge into different um, policy mechanisms? So we're in a set of design codes for downtown Miami, where, where you can essentially, if you go through Wedge, you get a waiver for some other city requirements. We're in the zoning code for New Rochelle. Um, so there's all of these different kind of um, different mechanisms that can be used to either incentivize or require components of the, of the Wedge standards beyond New York. And then that, that professionals training um, focus you know, in starting to, to connect with firms that have a really large presence in other cities, because we often find that it's, it takes multiple touch points for a project to move, to, to, to decide to, to pursue Wedge. Sometimes that's us reaching out directly, but often it's the lead engineering team or the lead architect on the project saying, hey, we're building to these standards or close to these standards, we think that you should be recognized for this. We, we should pursue wedge. It's that design team pushing, um, and that's a big part of how we're how we're getting our expansion. There's a you know a, a a site in Wilmington, North Carolina, was the first outside of New York. There's a Miami project that will start its review within the next I think the next two weeks is when we expect to get the uh, design documents for that. And then we're actively talking to projects in Boston, L.A., San Francisco, Jersey. Um, and a number of other places. So, it, but it takes a 
a multi-pronged approach to show that Waterfront Alliance in, it, in its presence is everywhere and adds value in all of these places. Thanks, Joseph. Well, really exciting that that you're getting so much traction uh, from other regions around uh, around the uh, the U.S. And uh, I think if we do a follow-on webinar, we'll also have to talk about uh, how to promote resilience development beyond the U.S. Uh, because I know we have a lot of uh, uh, members of Gary who who are, are not U.S. based as well. Um, so I think we um, before we go to closing remarks, we're 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 um, nearing the end of our allotted time here, uh, but I did want to make sure that we touch on something you just mentioned, Joseph, which is the topic of financing uh, and funding, which is really critical to the mission of Gary. Um, so, Shalini, I wanted to give you an opportunity to kind of take a crack at this. Um, you know, you mentioned that's part of kind of the the refocus um, uh, recipe, right, or, or or secret sauce. And in, in thinking about how to to really um, uh, scale this this work. Uh, the financing clearly is a really important piece. Uh, could you elaborate a little on on what you think those um, traction points are for engaging the finance community? Yeah, I'm going to give two answers here, Andrew, because I think there's a short term answer and then there's a mid to long term answer. Right now, many of the um, I think many of the key partners, especially in local governments and state governments who are looking at large scale resilience projects are completely overwhelmed with the amount of federal money that's available for infrastructure and for these types of projects. In the short term, the private sector and folks in the finance sector are going to have the most, I think, success where you think about private financing as adding on and filling gaps or bridging to where federal money is coming but will be slow. So really paying attention, for example, to recently disaster affected areas where they might be two or three years from seeing FEMA funding for recovery. Figuring out how to step into those spaces is where I think private finance can play a transformative role. So you're not just reacting and buying the flood pump, but you end up with that bathtub and sponge, right? I think in four to five years, you will see the fire hoses start to slow of public money. And a lot of regions are going to need to be very, very creative about how to sustain and continue large scale redevelopment projects. And that's where I think Wedge is a tremendous resource nationally, but also potentially internationally, both in the what and the how, right? <laughs> you do this work. And so I think being very smart, especially for folks in the insurance sector, about looking forward to that four or five years from now, where folks are worried about having built something that they need to expand or they can't sustain, can't sustain without private um, capital, that's going to be potentially transformational. And that's that's how we're thinking about 10 to 15 year development projects where you have, you know, reinforcing cliff sides to hold up major railway lines and critical supply chains. So I, I would look for inspiration on where critical infrastructure um, seems in peril <laughs> and start there. Critical infrastructure in peril. Um, well, that's an attention grabber uh, and one that I, I could definitely see as a as a traction point. Um, so we're we're approaching the end, and I wanted to give each of our panelists an opportunity for uh, kind of a rapid fire closing remark on you know one real opportunity for promoting resilient uh, uh, development uh, on on the coastline and. Shalini, you've given us a lot, uh, but if there's any sort of one remaining thought that you might want to leave uh, leave us with, uh, you know, here you've you've got one one last bite at the apple here. Yeah, I'll I'll do it in one sentence, which is I think for everybody listening to this conversation, always connect the greater good to the hyper local good. Communities don't care about the greater good. Everyone is struggling. And so you have to make this kind of stuff worth their while. And Bonnie, your example about, well, we're making trade-offs, but you're trading one thing for something that will leave you better off. Look for that better off. Don't just talk about the trillions of dollars saved or the hundreds of billions. 
Fantastic. Uh, love it. Um, Bonnie, um, over to you. What what are the takeaways that you think are, are, are scalable and that we need to learn from, from, from your recent experience? Yeah, I mean, I, I really think that um, because government can't do it all um, and can't be responsible for, you know, the well-being of so many private parcels, I think it really is a combination, again, of like the carrots and sticks of the regulation versus the incentives, trading off maybe density for resilience or, um, you know, in the case of infrastructure, like sewer rates for investment, that kind of thing. So I, I do think that the, the solutions are there, the money's there, it just it comes in the form of, of those trade-offs and, and those incentives. Um, and, and that's one thing government does have. They have the ability to create the incentives, to create the carrots, to create the sticks, frankly, um, to, to help push the private sector um, to be more creative. Making that creativity happen. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, a, a finely tuned, uh, a machine, I think, that, that that helps to foster that environment where the the creativity can can come forth. Um, Joseph, you get the last word before we close. Well, I'll use that time um, kind of for a commercial on wedge, since I I agree with my co-panelists and think they they summed up some of the lessons here really well. Um, if you have a waterfront project, reach out to to Waterfront Alliance. We want to be a resource for you. Um, as you as you're thinking about, you know, what are the kind of investments that that make sense? What are the features that that we can build into the site? Is this site something that that we should invest in, or is this a site that shouldn't be developed on? We're we're happy, and and, and the wedge standards can be really useful there. And then, if you're interested in learning more, um, the wedge professionals course is at wedgeprofessionals.org. I put the link into the chat. Um, learn about kind of how this gets applied on multiple sites. Domino Sugar is one of the case studies that we feature, um, but it's one of many um, that we feature. So you can see kind of how does this show up on an industrial property? How does this show up in a, a public sector park space? How does this show up? Um, or how do ports think about this? Um, so there's, there's lots of opportunities to use Wedge as a resource so that we can have waterfront developments that are more resilient, that are more ecological, and that have great public benefits and great accessibility. Well, Joseph, as busy as you are, I'm very happy to hear that you're still advertising, which means you can't be completely overwhelmed. <laughs> so that, that's great to see that there's still capacity and desire to expand. Um, well, on that note, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to uh, all three of our panelists, uh, Joseph, Bonnie, and Shalini. This was really a privilege and so much fun uh, to to have a, a, this discussion with you and, and really benefit from your, your deep insights in, in this space. So I, I hope the listeners uh, and viewers today uh, enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, thank you. And um, let me now pass the floor back to Lori uh, for any uh, closing housekeeping remarks. Sure. Well, thank you, Andrew. And also want to extend my thanks to um, Shalini and Bonnie and Joseph, and particularly to Andrew for pulling this together. Uh, there will be a, uh, we have recorded the session today, so we will send the recording out to everyone who registered and it will also be on the Gary website under convenings, uh, so you can find it there. And uh, yeah, I just want to reinforce this is exactly the kind of discussions that fit the Gary mission to catalyze investment and resilience. So we are, I really appreciate everyone being here and we have our next webinar is already scheduled for November 10th. Again, Andrew will be pulling together the panel and moderating. The topic is making resilience count, new accounting approaches to quantifying benefits to climate resilience investment. So that may sound like a dry topic, but you can see here that Andrew has a great style to bring to life a lot of different topics. And it's actually a very important topic to look at how do we catalyze more private sector investment and resilience. So um, consider that for November 10th and we will look forward to seeing you all there. So thanks again to everyone. I'd hope to see you on November 10th. All right, signing off. <laughs> thanks, Lori. Bye everyone. <laughs>